Football Convos number 12, Matt Waldman. Don't be afraid to look ridiculously wrong because the sooner that you are ridiculously wrong about something, the sooner you will figure out why that was and not do it again. For conversations with the players, coaches, and contributors that make this game great. Regulators, mount up. We're coming. Football Convos. We are here with the Andy Carlson produced Football Convos. Uh, I am Jeff Lloyd. I'll be hosting for the first time here today. Uh, Twitter-wise, you can find me at Jeff underscore LJ underscore Lloyd uh, with Draft Breakdown now, doing a lot of work over there. Obviously, it is the season for full-on nine weeks from today of Draft Talk. Uh, one of my favorite evaluators has joined us today, um, a brilliant, brilliant football mind, whether it's film-wise, whether it's with the written word, which seems to get lost in today's, uh, obviously, coverage of football, Mr. Matt Waldman. Matt, first of all, thanks so much for the time here today. Oh, Jeff, thanks. It's always a pleasure getting a chance to talk football with you. Thanks for having me on. Uh, anytime. Like I told you last night, uh, going for the first time, I wanted somebody I was a little comfortable with, but, uh, of course, any time to talk with you is always a good time. Um, Matt, obviously with football convos here and what Andy's tried to do, uh, we've tried to bring in some you know, different types, whether it, whether it is players themselves, whether it's coaches, all aspects. So obviously evaluation and you know, film study and critiquing is a huge part, which is the you know, main reason I want to choose with you here today. Um, so what we're going to start here with, and first question I want to come to with is obviously give us a little bit on the RSP film room and the work of Matt Waldman that I am such a huge fan of. How did it start? How did Matt get into this? Sure. You know, my background's a little bit different, but it's kind of funny. A lot of the evaluators that you see who are kind of doing the same thing I am, we, a lot of us didn't play football. And, you know, I played football every day probably until I was 18, but I didn't play organized football. Um, and I always loved the game, but I was, I, in, you know, I, I had a kind of a circuitous path towards all of this. And, and I w ended up, you know, I was in my early mid-30s in management. I was basically doing a lot of operations management as well as some quality management, learned some best practices and how to monitor performance for um, particular industries and had done a lot of work building databases and managing groups to kind of get them to, you know, help them perform at their best. And I was, you know, still a huge football fan. I had done some writing um, on and off over the years, and I and honestly, I just, just didn't really have the – I would say probably the courage or persistence to want to continue doing it at the time that I considered it when I was younger. And, uh, you know, at some point I just realized that this was something that I really wanted to do, that I wanted to write. And then I also decided that, you know, one of the first entries to do that would be fantasy football. So I started writing about fantasy football in the early 2000s. Um, and eventually, as I did that, I gravitated more towards the NFL draft and realized one day that, I had the skills to really look at how to evaluate performance based on best practices that are used in the industry and kind of realized that the NFL as an industry is actually has some very old and outdated ideas about a lot of things. And I thought it would be worthwhile just for the fun of it to, you know, put together a database with some monitoring, you know, evaluation criteria using those best practices and applying it to football. And I didn't think, you know, I didn't have the hubris to think that I, that because I learned this and I knew football better than anyone or that I would knew it more than scouts. There are a lot of scouts who do great work out there. But I thought that with the process that I had that I could develop over a span of years, and I've been doing this for 11 years now, that over those years that I could learn more and more and continue to build on that process because good processes help educate you. And you know, and develop more in terms of my football skills. So the RSP is really a it's a it's a study of the skill offensive skill positions. So I look at quarterback, running back, wide receiver, and tight end, and I define everything that I do. I have um, in terms of all the grading that I do, everything's done in sort of a weighted grading scale that's very transparent for people to see. Um, I write down everything I see play by play. Um, and then I do an analysis after that, after about a year, year and a half worth of study of these players, multiple games, I, I write everything up and do and do an analysis that's about a magazine length type of um, publication, you know, or a larger magazine in the range of about, you know, 170 to 200 pages. And then I show everyone all my work, which is kind of the insanity of it all, but I felt like early on, 
no one was really going to take me seriously if they didn't see the work that I put into it and see what exactly that I was doing. So the publication actually ends up being about, you know, between 1,000 and 1,100 pages. Um, it's an online publication, and most of the people who read it and swear by it are the ones who are going to read the first 200 pages and use it as a magazine. So I do that. I do a blog that is just a free blog that I, you know, study film and do much shorter analysis um, and just give samples of that work as well as the RFP film room this year, which is, you know, getting a chance to watch tape with guys like, you know, you, Jeff, and Ryan Riddle, a former NFL player or current NFL player like Chad Stan or a bunch of great analysts and draft guys um, on the scene. And we watch one player a cut up of their game of draft breakdown and, and talk about what we see. It's not a definitive look at the guy, but it's a way of being able to just educate each other as well as educate the public about um, what's looked for in, in certain positions and how we evaluate players. Yeah, I think the biggest thing with the film room is, is I hear it, you know, obviously, you know, me and you, matter, uh, you know, of, of the internet guys covering football. We're a little bit of the older generation. Um, we have some great young kids now, but a lot of them seem to be asking, and when I give them, you know, you know, go see, go watch the film rooms. They seem to pick up so much, and whether it's an Emory Hunt, whether it's a Ryan Riddle, you know, and some of the great guests you have, Kyle Posey, another one, um, a big fan I, I am of him, his, him as well. You know, they, they pick up, they able to see how the terms are used. You know, obviously, you know, we use so many terms. Some of these guys don't know exactly what they mean, or you see somebody throwing out a term in an offensive line. It might be something we use with a wide receiver. But the guys seem to come back every time I mention it and say, "Wow, you know, I, I learned a lot." You know, whether it's their evaluation of what they thought a said player was in agreement, they seem to be picking up so much. And obviously you, with the literature background that you have, is another thing that a lot of people keep to come to focus on, you know, on how well-written and how well-spoken your stuff is. So for that, I want to give you a compliment. But um, do me a favor, though. As far as, you know, how much, obviously, you speak about the literature background, how much do you think that gives you an edge into your work? I think it's just, uh, I don't know, but I appreciate the compliment. I mean, certainly, you know, it's funny. My, I'm a magazine writer by trade, so, uh, you know, it's sad to say this, but I feel like that my, my football writing is some of my worst just because I don't have an editor, and I don't, um, don't I, I'm usually putting out a lot of stuff very quickly. I think we all do in this in this scene. So it's, um, you, you know, it's it's a lot that's it's done in a very quick way, but I, I would say that, um, the, the experience of being a writer and writing every day and paying attention to it as a craft um, I think has helped me um, connect with people in ways that are a little bit more universal. And, but I think a lot of that, too, is just about living life. You know, I mean, we're, we're, like you said, we're a little bit of an older generation. I'm 45 years old. Um, I've certainly gone through uh, enough life experiences at, at this point and hope to have many more that, you know, fund what I write and and I've just you know I study stories I study you know I study good stories and what makes good stories and I try and use whatever I can pick up um, from really great writers um, to try and just kind of learn every day and just have the focus of trying to get better as a writer and and fortunately I've had folks that feel like that they, they like my voice and how I connect with people <laughs> Absolutely. Um, one one question I want to hit real quick here. Um, for you, obviously, you know the, the amount of coverage we get nowadays and how what we can use to evaluate. Um, give me like one or two things for you in the in eleven years since you've been doing this now. What's what's been the you know basically the be all end all that's helped everyone improve their game? In terms of, I'm sorry. Can you can you rephrase the question for me one more time? I, I didn't quite catch. Like what was what, what's, what's it the, like for evaluating? Yeah, what's like the biggest, you know, updates in anything that's made it easier to be, you know, as opposed to 11 years ago? Oh, absolutely. Well, where you're working right now, draft breakdown has got to be high on that list um, because I certainly tape a lot of games myself and watch them, but to be able to have people who are literally taping the games, cutting them up so that you can see all the relevant plays of that player in every situation of that game, just one after the other. And I don't have to deal with commercial breaks. I don't have to deal with the other side of the ball until I want to watch the other side of the ball with another player. Um, it saves me a lot of time. So I would say that that's very helpful. I would say Twitter has been a big deal because uh, so you know the rookie scouting portfolio is is a business for me. You know, I mean, this is I got into this and thought I'm not going to do all this crazy hard work if I don't think that I'm going to be able to at least 
make some money doing it in a way that, you know, my goal isn't to be rich doing this. If it was, I would have a really bad goal. But, it was, <laughs> but my goal is, my goal it was still is lofty enough to say, you know, look, maybe I could get out of bed in the morning each day and this could be like the main thing that I do. And I'm a lot closer to that now than I was, you know, 11 years ago, a lot closer. Um, and so it's, you know, the ability to Twitter has probably been also as strong or if not stronger of an influence because to be able to use, there's such a strong community of writers and readers and fans on using Twitter for football and to be able to get my work out and just promote it every day and just send links and just say, this is what I've written today. Here's where I'm featuring something somewhere else. Here, have a discussion, answer questions that people have, um, just goof around a little bit for people to get to know me a little bit. All of that has really helped draw people to what I do and to continue to stay with it in a way that I wouldn't have been able to achieve unless I had a lot of money and ability to hire a marketing team so it's as a grass it's been a great grassroots tool and I know that's maybe not something specifically for how it's changed with the draft but it's allowed me to keep functioning it's allowed me to also get to know folks like you Jeff and to get to know you know so many other writers and network and discuss the game and learn more from each other and just have that kind of just awesome community and that that's from both an intellectual and a you know marketing business side. Okay. Obviously, we just finished out in Indy with the Combine. Um, obviously, if you followed Matt a lot, you know Matt is not the one who's going to sit there and give you every 40 time and every drill. Um, so, Matt, give me some thoughts there. I mean, obviously, some people get really blown away by everything that's done. Me, I just like seeing the workouts. And, you know, I do like seeing the numbers. I, I want to see a guy on the stage with his peers you know, is he going to give everything he wants, you know, everything he's got in that opportunity? Some guys struggle with it. Some guys are all for it. Um, but as far as the combine and the numbers and everything that goes on for the, you know, six, seven days out in Indy, Matt, what does it really all boil down to in the end? Yeah, I mean, it's really what it boils down to is does it, does it, add, does it enhance what you already saw on film? Does it match it or does it detract from it? And does it, is it, does it make you want to go back and see whether or not you missed something or if there's something that could be very helpful to you. I, I mean, admittedly, I love hear, seeing the numbers. I love looking at them. I certainly use them. Um, I, I think the thing that I have to do and as a, as a writer is I have to kind of put the blinders and the earplugs on where everybody else in our community and how they're reacting to it because I don't want to, like, I don't want to be influenced by hearing somebody I respect go, oh, my gosh, that guy's now, you know, that guy's moving up, going to move up now because uh, he ran this 40 time or leaped this, you know, broad jump this this far. So it, to me, it's more of wanting to make sure that I stay in my own lane and 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 pay attention to my own process. So that's where, that's why I'm usually not too, too, I'll, I'll talk about things, but I don't go too far and get too far into it. I just want to look at a player and say, okay, does Chris Conley's amazing, you know, combine effort match what he does on film? You know, does is somebody like Leonard Williams, who may not have great agility times compared to other players at his position, I want to look at his own height and weight and wonder if he's actually got great agility and great athleticism for his size. Um, and he's, or is he an exception to the rule? Or is linebacker Paul Dawson, as you know, your colleague John, our colleague John Owings wrote about recently, you know, should you throw out the combine times because really the combine is trying to simulate what they do on the field. And if you watch what he does on the field and with the speed that he does it and against the competition he does it against, maybe the combine is it's the exception to the rule here where the combine doesn't simulate it as well as it should. So there's a lot of individual small little tweaks that you're making. I'm not one that just uses it as a blanket throw, you know, throw the blanket over every position and say, you know, that because I, if they don't do X, then the, the formula then is adjusted for everybody. Yeah, I mean, you know, the prime examples, obviously, you know, Trey Waynes is another one right now. Everybody, you know, they're lighting them up. I mean, I've seen to the Jets at six, you know, due to a 40 time, and then you take another variable like the three cone where he was actually slower 
and which the three cone obviously you know we're talking short area quickness that's probably the biggest indicator there is but now we're talking long speed long speed's great if you got beat and you got to make up but you know how is he, how is he going to do How's he going to do covering wise in the first five yards? And plus, I mean, he's a little bit lighter, you know, in the mid 180s. You know, is he going to be able to quick jump on a slant on a 215 pound kid? Maybe, maybe not when he's given up 30 pounds. So the test scores are great, but uh, obviously the film, of course, is always, you know, what you have to go with with the be all end all. For me, one takeaway, a guy I want to get into is Jeremy Langford from Michigan State. I had him labeled as a plotter. I didn't think there was much quickness to it. Now I want to go back and see, is, is there explosion there that I missed from a guy like Jeremy Langford who seemed to test pretty well. So two Michigan State guys kind of coincidentally right there I dropped. A, um, as far as now, obviously with the offensive skill positions, Matt, you know, and me, you know, love the wide receivers as well. What is, what is the biggest thing you are looking for when you're putting on tape of a wide receiver? I would say the biggest thing, and it's, and it's, not, it's not something that it would be – you know, fatal if he doesn't do it, but it is something that if I, I, I do look at it and value it because, you know, I think we all have things that value that we value when we watch players and go, if I ran a team or if I were a coach, this is the type of player I want or I don't want. And I would say the biggest thing that always catches my eye is can he make a play against tight coverage or with income imminent contact? I want to know that he's going to be able to make a catch where he's got someone glued on him or he's going to take a hit. Because to me, that t- says toughness, focus, concentration, and that the quarterback can count on this guy in the big moments. And to me, if he can't do that, that's the difference between being you know, a primary wide receiver for an NFL team and being a talented athletic contributor who may rotate off the bench, so or being a guy who doesn't make a team at all. Yeah, I mean the guy. You know, when you're talking third and ten, you're talking a guy running. You know, a ten to twelve yard square in. You know, with a linebacker underneath him, a 225 pound safety over him, ready to knock his head off. Are you catching that ball? Am I throwing it to you? Get open, catch the ball. Otherwise, you know, you can stand out there and run all the go, you know, the, the deep go routes all day long. And there's guys in the league who make a living doing that. And if you're wide open every now and then, you'll catch one. But it comes down to, you know, the stones and the money downs and, you know, whether or not you can you can do that. We don't see it, – it seems it's starting to go a little bit away now just because these kids are the phenomenal athletes that they are. They can get away with not doing everything by the book, I guess. You know, if you went back and you showed them all Jerry Rice, they'd kind of probably laugh at you because, you know, they know – they're better athletes, but they don't respect the hard work, the dedication, and the route running sometimes that goes into it. So it's just it's funny just the way the game evolves there and things of that nature. Um, now, as far as other things that people look for in evaluation, give me something that you think some guys get high on that maybe you, besides combine, that you tend to back shy away from a little bit. I, I think it is. I think a little bit is the, um, I would say speed. Speed is really the thing that I shy away from a good bet. I mean, it's certainly important to a wide receiver, but 40 speed to me is a um, 40 speed to me is is great when you're talking about you know those three to four shots per game that, that they take. You know, but I'm really looking for quickness and the ability to get off the line of scrimmage, or at least the potential to be able to get off the line of scrimmage. Because if you can't do that than your Cordero Patterson right now. You're fast, you're amazing with the ball in the hand, but unless the offense is specially made towards you, you're not going to get a chance to get the ball in your hand because you're not getting open for your quarterback. Um, and that's something that, that's why when I look at the great athleticism and the great speed, that's, to me, that's icing on the cake. Um, to, to a certain extent, it's not the cake itself. Exactly. I mean, you take, you know, you take a guy for uh, Rashad Green, for example, you know, obviously, you know, the numbers came well and, uh, you know, it didn't hurt him, definitely tested to, you know, what we were hoping for. But there's guys who just know how to run routes and get open and some guys just don't. He's a prime example of it. You would, you would want to take Rashad Green and put him in a room with Cordero Patterson for as long as it took and say, look, this guy who is not you athletically can do everything we would hope he could do with the athleticism you have. But some guys get it, some guys don't. So, there's, yeah, obviously there's a lot of that going on. 
Um, as far as you know, the RSP and everything you're doing there, do you have anything you're looking to add or more you want to get to as you evolve with it, Matt? Oh, yeah. I continue to do that every year. In fact, I updated the RSP, the grading checklist for um, – each of the positions this summer. So I've added a number of different things or tweaked things in a way. For instance, with wide receivers, we'll start with that. I mean, I changed my wide receiver checklist to the point where now I've, you know, added a much more, far more um, points for how, for technique with how to release from the line of scrimmage. I find that a very important thing. And over the years, I'll, you know, I'll watch tape and I'll make notes of something. And, and it's not so much of whether I hit or missed on a player it's more looking back and going, how do I describe what this player is or isn't doing and what's important about what a player should or shouldn't be doing? Um, and am I covering that when I grade that player in the RSP? Is what I'm grading fitting there? And if I find that I, I'm finding points that I'm talking about over and over again with players, but I can't, I don't have a grade for it, I don't have a criteria point for it, then you know, maybe I should add one. So for wide receivers, I've added things like three and four step relief techniques, effective shake moves, stack moves, rip moves, chop moves with their hands, how to do a hook plant swim, you know, more than just saying they release well from the line of scrimmage because they can, or saying that they can use their hands to release from the line of scrimmage. I would rather, I'd, I'd rather you not have a coverall for that and actually break it down into smaller point values that I grade on a 100-point scale, you know, for all of these things and give, like, one point to, if they can do a shake move and give them one point if they do a chop well, you know, and then it gives me more of a more way to break down and say they can use a few moves at the line of scrimmage as opposed to they only have one move. Um, or they have none at all. So there's things like that. Um, I talk about different styles of breaks. Um, you know, those are some things that I've added to, added to the, you know, to the route running technique for that. For running backs, um, I've broken down a little bit more when it comes to, what have I changed with this? I would say, um, you know, some of the things that I've looked at are, have to do with vision over the years. I've changed it to, breaking down vision to talk about the decisions that they make, whether they're judicious about staying inside or bouncing outside on a run, um, talking about patience, but also looking at how they read the line of scrimmage before or right after the snap and the types of decisions they make with that. Um, so breaking down burst and speed um, are different things that I've changed over the years or um, how they use their feet. You know, it's not just about whether they can juke somebody out or spin, but whether they can vary their stride length and vary their stride pace. And, and, and it's really not so much about their feet, even though it's listed in that area. It's more about how they integrate using their feet with what they see. And oftentimes we see that with, we hear Bill Walsh talk about in the past, that a quarter, you can tell what a quarterback sees based on how he moves his feet. I think the same goes for most players um, at every position, and especially running backs. So um, the more control they have over their feet, the better. So those are some examples. I've done the same with quarterbacks and, and tight ends with blocking and, and a variety of different footwork and arm release type of um, things that I can kind of pinpoint mechanical stuff that, that is easier, that helps me to identify situations where I can say this is easier to fix, this is tougher to fix, this affects a player's upside, this is where they probably best matched in an offensive scheme. So it, it just aids the analysis long term. Um, if you could give yourself, obviously now you said 11 years, if you could give Matt Waldman 11 years ago a little advice from Matt Waldman, what he's learned and been through today. What, what would it be? <laughs> um, I would probably say to – I would probably just have offered encouragement to say just keep doing what you're doing. Don't get so down at certain points about um, how that works out um, in terms of just like be, continue to be patient. And I would say that just continue to stick with the process and keep wanting to learn and just stay in your lane and keep working on what you're doing and compete with yourself. <laughs> uh, we're going to do a little three and out here before we start wrapping this up here today, Matt. Um, who has been the most influential and in obviously the career transition for you and where you are now? 
Um, two people probably. Um, the first would be a professor that I met. I was a jazz, an aspiring jazz musician when I was 18 to you know 22 years old, or going to school at the University of Miami, and I took a creative writing course. Um, I don't know why I took it. I was just kind of interested. I did a little bit of writing in high school, but not enough, not much. I didn't even really enjoy reading literature that much. Um, but I took a class, and she wa the professor walked in. She was a published author, but she told her story. She basically said that she her name was Evelyn Mayerson. I don't even know. Unfortunately, she's still alive today. But um, but Evelyn Mayerson was a, a Pulitzer Prize nominated novelist who, before that, dropped out of the University of Miami to get married, raise a family, um, help put her husband through law school. Then, when their kids graduated, decided to get her go to co back to college, end up getting a graduate degree in psychology. Got, wrote for the New England Journal of Medicine for a while, and she told us all these stories. And then, how when her father died, she wrote a book about a uh, with a protagonist of, who had Down syndrome, and she was like 18 years old, and it was a love story. And she had a um, Isaac Bashiva Singer, who was a you know one of a, a great um, figure in literature in American literature see her work and say it's good, very good, but no one's going to publish a book about a woman with Down syndrome. Um, and she ended up getting nominated for a Pulitzer. And she told us a story. And what I got from it was, you know, at 18, my parents, you know, and my grandparents, they had the same job all their lives, or that's what the expectation was. So I was still in that kind of generation um, and that kind of thinking. And I saw this woman who was, you know, my grandparents' age basically telling me that she's had seven careers and that we're probably going to have multiple careers in our life. So being someone who wasn't sure whether music was it for me, that that was very inspiring to know that I'm, you know, that I had to that I didn't have to pick one career. And then the second inspiration for me was my current editor, his name's Kent Hannon. He used to be a Sports Illustrated writer. Um, back in the 70s and 80s, um, he covered the NFL and, the, and, and college foot and college basketball. Um, and he's written a number of features with, you know, he, he wrote with them for years. If you remember the Larry Bird cover where he's making the shush sound and it says the best kept secret in college basketball, he wrote that feature. Um, and Kent was, uh, Kent was one of my teachers early on when I decided that I wanted to study journalism which lasted all of about a quarter, but I never forget a lot of the advice he gave me and the encouragement he gave me. Um, and I was just kind of a mixed up kid who basically said to me, you know, he basically said to me, he said, you have a lot of talent, you could go far doing this. And I want, still wanted to be a musician and was kind of frustrated that something that I didn't really work as hard, nearly as hard at early on, someone t said that I had talent to do it if I continued to apply myself. And I was, you know, I just spent three years, you know, busting my ass trying to be a musician, and wishing I could hear the things that I heard as a, uh, as an aspiring writer. So, you know, it took me a while to kind of work up to that, um, to get to the point that I that I actually started writing. But Kent had always been a, you know, let me do some work for him over the years, do some freelance work while I was in a management career. And when I finally got the courage up enough to do it. I found his office where he worked at the University of Georgia, still publishing a magazine or editing a magazine, and told him I wanted to do some freelance work for him. And within a year, I, I started working for him, and he's my boss to this day, actually. And he's a he's been a great mentor um, as as a writer and someone who also you know has a great expertise covering sports. Absolutely great, great. Sam, uh, your professor down in Miami, definitely. Uh, I had one myself uh, at, at Monmouth. Uh, at the time, wrote for it was one of them teen. I can't remember the name now. I'm drawing a blank, but it was one of those teen rock magazines back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, that was what he did. And then he came in and uh, you know told a story about growing up on Long Island, getting in a big brawl, and it was just you see how guys with writing talent end up there because even when they tell you a story, you're glued to every word they said. Me, I was not the greatest student. I was not you know great with attendance, but Professor John Morano did never missed a class with him. Uh, yeah. Number two here on the three and out. Um, we have some really young guys evaluating these days, and with the Internet age and their writing skills are ridiculously good. What do you give advice? I mean, we have, I know we have some kids who don't even have a driver's license yet, and they're just churning out solid work. What do you give all these kids the advice as they, you know, the years go on for them? Now, talking about writing or talking about analyzing? or Well, you know, the writing and the evaluation process. The evaluation process, I would say, I would say stick to your process and and can you and continue to learn from it and try and add to it 
each year and just approach it as you are trying to figure out how you see players and you are trying to learn and it's good to learn from other people but don't worry about rankings I would say that would be my first thing It's just don't worry about rankings you're gonna to have to rank players and you're going to, have to go through that process but worry more about what you see and how you see how you see them and try and get that as right as you can um, and when you don't don't worry about it you're gonna make mistakes um, but when you listen to other people use that to look to go back and look and see if you see that and if you don't don't do it out of any type of you know peer pressure or worry that you're gonna look wrong be be don't be afraid to look ridiculously wrong um, okay. and because the sooner that you are ridiculously wrong about something the sooner you will figure out why that was and not do it again and then you'll do it again somewhere else but that's okay because trust me I you know I get a lot of, I've been getting a lot of credit over the past few years for seeing Russell Wilson for what he was um, but I also love John Beck I also loved Blaine Gabbert, um, and I knew, you know, I had people saying, well, Blaine Gabbert, you know, he's he has a real rough time, you know, handling pressure, and the tape that I saw of him, I didn't see that, um, and then when I, then in hindsight, I went back and looked at some of the other tape that I didn't get a chance to see, and I didn't see enough, you know, that happens, John, Be you know, there's, and then there's going to be players that you love who you still think to this day could be good, but they just didn't get a fair shot. I have like three or four of those guys that I, to this day, like, I, you know, I'm laughing because there's like the, the inner part of me that goes, I think that, you know, one day he's going to get into a game. Like Cedric Pierman is a running back from Virginia who mm -hmm. plays with the, with the Bengals. I still think to this day that the Bengals have made a grave mistake not using him more. And they even literally, they even somewhat admitted that in the sense that Jay Gruden, after like a hundred combined hundred yard effort when they needed him he had a two or three game stretch that was fairly nice for them when they had injuries they said we didn't really know what we had in him because we just pegged him as a special teamer because he had bounced around a little bit um, so you, you know I would just say you, you you're really doing this for yourself you want people to read you you want to be able to you know have this community but more than anything if you're doing it you're doing it to approach how to learn more about the game and the joy of what the, what comes from um, you know learning more about players and football and appreciating what they do and the rest is you know gravy to a certain extent so Cedric Pierman member of the all Waldman team I assume yeah he's a I'm the you know I'm sure I've got fantasy owners who 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 are in leagues who joke about it because I liked him so much. But yeah, I'm I'm still I'm still a diehard Cedric Fearman. You know, I'm holding the torch for the guy. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. And uh, we're going to close here with the, the three and have one last question. Uh, could you give us a book recommendation? Doesn't have to be football related. Could be life related. Anything of the sort. What is an inconsequential book in the Matt Waldman opinion? Um, I would say a very consequential book in, in this is um, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott, which is a book about writing and life. Um, and I think that Anne Lamott is, she's written a number of books about writing, and she's, you know, she talks a lot about her life and family, but it's more than anything, it talks about the insecurities that go with um, trying to stare at a blank page and fill it up with something meaningful that people are going to want to read um, and what goes in behind that and the business of it and all the insecurities that we all have you know um, and I think that that's one of the that's one of the great things about being a writer is that you can you can you can connect with people by using the things that we all yeah I had this conversation with Sigmund Bloom of football guys this morning you know we all have the impulse to do things um, you know, to think things or think things that, that aren't so nice or we worry about or afraid of. Um, but really the difference that separates us, you know, as we mature is whether we act on those impulses that are negative impulses, you know. And I think that she does a really great job of, of really showing what all those negative impulses can be when you're an aspiring writer, um, but at the same time help you navigate through that so that you don't act on them. Okay, I just wrote it down here. I'm going to Google that right after this. Um, Matt, uh, one last time before I let you go here, obviously. Uh, let everybody know where they can find you at. And for a mere $10, the wealth and the fruit of the labor from Mr. Matt Waldman could be yours. 
So go ahead and get. <laughs> well, it's actually uh, it's actually 1995, but oh, it's, um, oh, that's right. I'm it, sorry. It, the the early right. bird rate is over. The, the early, the early bird, bird, yeah, the early bird 17. Now for past issues for ten dollars, you can get the past issues up through 2014. Um, but you can find me at mountwaldmanrsp.com, um, and that's that's where you can find my blog and read up on everything. And then you can also find a way. You know, to purchase the RSP through that, and it's available every April 1st is the, the pre-draft publication, which is the one I described. And then for fantasy owners, I do a post-draft analysis that comes out a week after the draft, and that's for free or maybe more accurately part of that 1995 package. So you get probably somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 pages worth of material, and, you, and you're probably going to read about 300 pages worth of it and have the rest as reference. Um, that is devoted towards you know being a draft nick as well as a fantasy owner um, and shows kind of you know both the nuts and bolts of football as well as the nuts and bolts of fantasy football and how you know this class applies to it okay matt always a pleasure um you know always you know always talking always tweeting back and forth appreciate you know all the help you've always been giving me uh you have, had a uh, fine time to give to me uh just a huge fan i appreciate all your time matt Hey, man, I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be on, and, and thanks for, for choosing me as a guest. And, and you know, I look forward to us hanging out and talking some more. You got it. Mr. Matt Waldman, as we close out the Football Convos podcast, the, uh, the, the child of Mr. Andy Carlson, one of the many fine works he puts out producing-wise and on-air talent himself. Hope everybody uh, is going to enjoy the show. Like I said, Matt is an excellent, excellent talk to this time of year. Well, any time of the year, obviously, but football-wise, there's not too much better than Mr. Waldman. Thanks, everybody, for your time here today, and we will call this a wrap. Thanks for listening to Football Convos. For more football conversations, visit footballconvos.com or visit us at iTunes. <laughs>